By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have something, something completely different, something we haven't done before here on the channel. Uh, we've got four guys sitting at a table playing magic and they're playing Commander Old School. So this is a four player multiplayer game four guys sitting on a table. We all have a commander deck, old school of course, to play with today. And as you can see, I've just put my camera at the furthest corner of the table so that I try to like catch every battlefield there. And um, yeah, this is going to be an interesting one also for me to commentate and, and try to follow everything that's going to happen. Just to give you an idea of the deck. So it's, it is it is uh, old school that we're playing uh, commander here. Casper uh, is playing with uh, a deck with Oaken Shield, so that's his commander. The other player is called Frank, he's playing with um, Del Pietro as his commander. We've got Gideon and he is playing with a Rubinia Soul Singer as his commander. And then of course I am also at the table and I am playing with the Falconer as a commander. So just to give you an idea of the kind of decks and colors you can expect today in this episode. Um, now, before I go into the rules, into the deck deck, because I've got, actually got beautiful deck pictures of all four of these decks, I first would like to point out that there's a description below and there you can find a timestamp. If you click on the timestamp, that will take you straight to the actual action, straight to the games themselves. So you can click there if you want to skip the rules and the deck deck. Um, for now, I'm just going to continue with the rules because what we've done, we've used a 10 point system and the 10 point system is based, uh, is, is actually, it is the system that was designed by the Brothers of Fire. It's an old school group from London. In the description below, there's a link. You can click on the link and then you can read all about that point system. I'm, this is not a point system that was developed overnight. They really thought about this. They blocked about this. They tested this. I'm very enthusiastic about this point system. Uh, to give you an example, what I mean by a point system, you can spend a total of 10 points and specific cards that are quite strong in this format, they will cost you points. For example, GM de Tome, you know, it's a very strong artifact that will cost you three points. In total, you can spend 10 points. So if I decide to put a GM de Tome in my deck, that means that I have seven points left to spend on cards like a Soul Ring, uh, the Power, but also Triskelion is a card with points. So um, it, it, it's the, the point system is there to make sure that you get a balanced experience and you don't see the same decks winning every time or the same cards appearing. Because I think one of the charms of Commander is that you play with cards that you usually don't play with. So I, I'm really enthusiastic about systems that are kind of catered towards that need. You know, I want to see weird old school cards. I love that, you know. So if there's a format that allows me uh, to play with cave people, man, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I want to go for it. So this was about the rules. And now we're actually going to go and look at the deck. So I have deck pictures of each of this, these decks. I would like to start with the deck of Casper. And here we see the deck of Casper and his commander is Aiden Oakenshield. So Aiden Oakenshield, a card from Legends, it's a 1-2 creature for a green, a red and a black and its ability it is pretty strong. You can pay a green, a red and a black, tap it and select one creature from your graveyard and place it right back into your hand. And it's of course very powerful in commander where there are constant board wipes and Aiden Oakenshield wouldn't simply go back to the command zone. He can cast Aiden Oakenshield again and um, and then he can get a creature card back. And you actually see that uh, as well. He's playing with Nevenerals Disc, so that's a way to accomplish that. And you also see a regeneration in his deck. So maybe he's hoping to put a regeneration on Oakenshield and just keep uh, getting creatures back without having to put Oakenshield back into the command zone and again, uh, keep paying that uh, command cost because there's a tax, right? You got to pay two mana extra every time it goes to the command zone and then you want to bring it back into play. Now, if we look at the rest of this deck, uh, I see a lot of strong cards. So let's just have a look at the red. Of course, we see some direct damage there with Fireball, Pyrokinesis, Lightning Bolt, Disintegrate, and also a Mana Flare there tucked away so that Mana, mana Flare can do a lot of damage. I think Stone Rain is also a good inclusion. There's always a Maze of If somewhere to destroy. And nice to see here a Kelden Warlord. That is pretty cool. And we also see an Ali from Cairo. And of course, Ali from Cairo with the regeneration on it. Ooh, that could be difficult to get rid of. For people that don't know, Ali from Cairo is from the Arabian Nights expansion. 
I believe two red and two to cast. And as long as it's in play, your life total cannot go below one. So in other words, you cannot die. This card was actually, believe it or not, it was banned for a while from Magic the Gathering because the wizard said it is too powerful. Uh, but then I guess they discovered creature removal. So, I mean, this is a, a very, it's not an overpowered card by a long shot. It's uh, it's fine. You can play it. What I also really like to see in this deck is a Dwarven Demolition team. That's quite cool. I mean, we are playing Commander. I believe I'm playing with a couple of walls. I'm sure my opponents do. So maybe that Dwarven Demolition team could do some work. What I also like is the uh, Ball Lightning in combination with Aiden Oakenshield. You can tap... Uh, Aiden to get the ball lightning back and cast it again and again and again. So that can be, ooh, that can be tricky. And also the Aladdin is quite nice. There are another card from Arabian Nights, uh, two red and two to cast as well. And with Aladdin, you can actually tap it and you can gain control of an artifact. Now, the cool thing is you can untap Aladdin again next turn, steal another artifact, and you're going to keep both as long as Aladdin's still alive. So that is pretty nice. Let's now take a look at the black cards in his deck. We see Royal Assassin, Sorcerer's Queen. That's all quite nice. Uh, we see an Order of the Ebon Hand, Protection from White. So that could be uh, could be strong. Also with the Black Knight, then a Hippie, a Sengir Vampire. I actually like the Howl from Beyond inclusion because that's going to work really well with the Mana Flare combination also. And it's just also this card that can just get you the victory out of nowhere. Interestingly enough here, he has chosen to put in a Raise Dead and an Animate Dead. And I'm, I guess Animate Dead makes sense because you can choose from everybody's graveyard. So there's always something juicy somewhere in Commander. So that's a really good inclusion. But the raise that puzzles me a little bit since he already has Aiden Oakenshield to do that. A really nice card there as well in the land section is Arena. That is a pretty cool card uh, to fight with. Again, could be a nice combination with Bull Lightning, kind of using Bull Lightning as a, uh, uh, as a removal spell. Very interesting. So we've got Arena there. And then let's take a look at the green because we haven't looked at the green section at all of his deck. So of course we see some ramp with the Lanaware Elves and the Birds of Paradise. I think we're going to see that a lot. Uh, we see the Satire there. The Killer Bees, interesting. Flying pump effects that could prove to be uh, to be dangerous for, for the opponents here. And also the Argovian Pixies I think is a very good inclusion to one because there's always an artifact somewhere and the Argovian Pixies can just block that. Doesn't take any damage from artifacts. So that's really nice. Uh, Titania's Song in there. Wow. And he's playing with a lot of artifacts, by the way. So that can that can cause some serious hammock, that Titania's Song. Wow. Ooh, can you imagine a situation with Titania's Song on the board and then somebody casts her like a Wrath of God or something? Wow. That would be quite interesting. And of course, we see, I believe that's a German uh, Sylvan Library. Very strong card, especially in Commander. You really need that card selection. We see some really sweet golden cards. I also like the inclusion of Xira in this build. It's got the same colors. And of course, that lets you draw a card. Would have actually been a pretty good Commander as well, now that I think about it. I mean, it's just a draw engine. And then you have that in your Command Zone and you can just cast it anytime you want to. I mean, that's, that's pretty sweet. And then... Um, yeah, we see some pretty interesting uh, interesting artifacts here. I think the Tetravis, again, works really well with Aiden Oakenshield. Get the counters off. Then if the Tetravis dies, who cares? You just take it back and you get even more flyers in return when you cast it again. Um, I do like that horn from Legends. Isn't it the horn of deafening or something? Um, I believe you can pay an amount and tap it and then target creature deals no combat damage this turn. So that's actually quite nice. I also like the inclusion of Aladdin's Ring. I think in a commander game that can go quite long. It could actually be pretty useful. So overall, I think, oh, and we haven't even talked about Siphon Soul. Siphon Soul. Siphon Soul is the first card that I saw where I thought, wait a minute, this card is actually better in commander than one on one. Like it was one of the first cards that made me realize, or I mean not commander, but multiplayer, one of the first cards that made me realize, hey, there are magic cards that function better in a multiplayer environment. And Siphon Soul is one of them. So really cool inclusion here by Cusper. I think this deck is quite strong. Um, maybe it's a little bit too strong that there's just so much danger coming from Cusper that people are going to attack him, if you know what I mean. That's always a danger in Commander if your deck is too strong or your spells that you cast at the start of the game are too strong. But this looks like a very solid deck and definitely a contender to go for the victory today. Um, let's go to the other deck and let me check, check my list. And that's the deck of Frank. So we're going to look at Frank's pirate deck. And here we see the deck of Frank and what a cool deck it is. And 
Let's just start with the commander again. We have Ramirez de Pietro. It's actually six to cast and it's a 4-3. It's not even a 4-4, four, 4-3 four, four, first striker. So it's pretty clear that Frankie really went for flavor, choosing the captain as his commander. How cool is that? And I mean, I have to admit, it's a super stylish uh, dude. Of course, art here by Phil Foglio. Just a beautiful picture. Um, but in terms of usefulness, it's not very useful if you compare it to the Oaken Shield we saw in Casper's deck that can really change and have an impact on the game. This commander, not that much, but still it's super cool because look at his deck picture. How cool is this deck picture? What he's done, he said, you know, this is my pirate commander deck. And uh, we see Ramirez there, the captain and his fleet. We see merchant ship, pirate ship, war barge. Um, and ghost ship so that's just beautiful playing with those ships then we have the motley crew and there's also a timmy there timmy the pirate so uh, how cool is that and we have also the pirate tricks there in on the right and then the right bottom we have the uh, the terrorists okay the terrorists from the deep oh man this deck is just beautiful loot and plunder of course that's treasure and I, I love the way that he's uh, he's uh, he's put that um, that legends card with the sleeping bear because that's um, that's like gold powder that the the person in the art is like putting dust powder on the uh, on the bear. So um, I believe there's gold in the title as well. I forgot the title of that card right now. L let me know in the comments below if you if you know the title of this card. But loot and plunder. I mean, very cool, very creative. And then the piratey gear. Oh man, I love the fact that the rocket launcher is in the piratey gear. I can so see that happening. You know, get the rocket launcher, and they're standing on the pirate ship, and they're using the rocket launcher. Very cool. And also the murky waters, of course, with the um, with the Diamond Valley there. But also that that beautiful Legends card. Um, what is the name of that again? I, 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 need, I need to work on my on my card knowledge here. It's a, it's a card that lets you band with other blue legends. It's like completely useless, but it's beautiful art. And I have to say that whole land cycle in legends is just stunning, stunning art. Um, looking at this deck, it's actually, it's not a bad deck. It's very flavorful. But besides the flavor, if I look at the cards, they're actually pretty good. If you look at that Motley crew, um, he's got the Merfolk Assassin War Barge combination going on. He's got Sea Singer combined with Phantasmal uh, Terrain. The, I mean, he's got some tricks up his sleeve. He's got the Nettling Imp with the Royal Assassin. Um, interesting crew, by the way, to be there. And um, also, he's got the, um, the Overlord there. It's one of my, art-wise, one of my favorite cards. Uh, and it, you can tap it to destroy target creature that has an enchantment played on it. I think in multiplayer, that's actually a pretty good... Think about um, the regeneration we saw in Casper's deck. All of a sudden, playing a regeneration on a creature might not be such a good idea. Yes, you can regenerate, of course, because it destroys it only. But still, every turn when, there, when he Overlord untaps, he can uh, target it again. And uh, he's playing with a Flood, which I think, again, is uh, what, a, what a flavor winner. He's also playing with Fish Liver Oil. Now, Fish Liver Oil and Merfolk Assassin is a very good combination, but also Fish Liver Oil with the Overlord is a very good combination. So I'm seeing this deck. I think this deck is full of little secret synergies, which we're about to kind of discover. I also see um, a Siren Skull in combination with Icy Manipulator, for example, and Royal Assassin and... You know, we see the Sorcerer's Queen uh, that can do a lot of trickery. Of course, we've got a lot of steel cards in here because they're pirates. So we've got Control Magic. We've got Steel Artifact. I also really like the Greed, really on flavor. I like the Fear because you're you're fearful of pirates. I just, I think this is a really cool deck. What I like as well is um, to see a Hummerit Spawning Bat here uh, in the deck of Frank. The Hummerit Spawning Bat is pretty cool. It's a card from um, Fallen Empires. And what you can actually do, you can pay, I think, two blue and one. You can sack target blue creature and you get one, one Kamerit tokens equal to the casting cost. So, for example, if you look at Deep Spawn, Deep Spawn is eight to cast. If you would sack... Um, Deep spawn to the uh, spawning bed. Frank is actually going to get eight Kamarit tokens. How cool is that? And I believe he's playing with Sunken City and it gives all his blue creatures plus one plus one. So, I mean, in theory, we could see a board state where we have um, the Hummerit spawning bed 
sacking a big creature like a sea serpent, a, a giant shark, a deep spawn, and then pumping them up with Sunken City, right? And then he can attack with a huge army of Comrade tokens. It chances are slim, but it could actually happen. I just think this deck is this deck really makes me happy. This is the kind of deck I want to play against. This is the kind of deck I don't mind losing against. Um, it's really it's a true beauty, Frank. Piece of art, my man. Um, so this is Frank's deck. Now let's take a look at Gideon's deck and his Rubinia Soul Singer. And here we see the deck of Gideon. And I think maybe Gideon has the strongest commander of all of us in the form of Rubinia Soul Singer. And this 2-3 legendary creature fairy is a one blue, one white, one green, and two to cast. So a total of five for a 2-3 body, which I think is, is pretty good for this type of creature. And it reads, you may choose not to untap Soul Singer during your untap step. Tap gain control of target creature for as long as you control Rubinia and Rubinia remains tapped so this i mean this is a commander as soon as it's cast there will be aggression towards Gideon. i just know this this is so in a way it's really good to have a strong commander on the other side it can kind of get you in trouble because people will be afraid that you will steal their their creatures or maybe there will be some politics going on but knowing us and knowing how we play at the table eh, probably try to attack him um if we look at the deck of of Gideon, he's he's got some some tricks actually with the rubinia soul singer like that astronaut's altar that we see on this picture so he can steal a creature then sack it to the altar so that's actually quite nice and i'm just kind of skimming through his list trying to see if i see any other sack outlets um there's also a preacher which works nice with the astronaut's altar as well. So that's also, he's got kind of a steel theme in his deck when you look at it. He's got control magic, he's got preacher, he's got the soul singer. So he's got, he kind of has that going on and um, there are just a lot of strong cards in his deck. I really like to see that Wrath of God in uh, with the Hive combination is very classic. Destroy everything with Wrath of God, then start making 1-1 one, one tokens. I kind of like that. Um, I think Lantex is a very good inclusion. It's just a very strong card in Commander. Any any mana fixing actually is quite strong. And of course, he's playing with three colors as well, so he needs that. Interesting to see that that Casper and um, and Gideon are playing with three colors. Frank is playing with two colors, blue and black, and I'm also playing with two colors. So it's going to be interesting to see if um, if that makes a big difference and also the witch hunter here is a nice inclusion i think uh two white and two and uh, you can tap it to deal one damage to an opponent and you can also tap it to return a creature of an opponent to uh, its controller's uh, owner sorry its owner's hand um by the way i'm now looking at his list again i see a safe haven safe haven rubinia sorcerer and safe haven preacher is another really nice combo i'm just kind of like going through the list trying to see if i if I find any any combos, of course, Ivory Tower, Lantex, Sylvan Library is really nice synergies. Um, I like the Avoid Fate as well to protect the Rubinia Soul Singer because I think as soon as it hits the board, people are going to try to get rid of it. Um, we see an Altered Transmute Artifact, by the way. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And um, yeah, it's looking it's looking pretty good. I'm, I'm I think this is a very solid list. I like the Sylvan Library Simbat as well, that synergy. By the way, talking about sec outlets, I see he's playing with Sage of Latinum. Sage of Latinum is a blue and one, a one, two creature. You can tap it to second artifact and draw a card. So I like the Hive in combination with Sage of Latinum, but I also like the idea of stealing an artifact creature with Preacher or Rubinia Soul Singer, feeding it to the Sage of Latinum. He's gonna read the book and then you get to draw a card. So. I, I can see a lot of nice little little synergies. I also like the way that he's added a fog in his deck. I think that card is a little bit underplayed. And he's also playing with one of the Elder Dragons. So I I, I have to admit, Gideon, that's really cool that you've included that in your deck. That is really a boss card and that's a boss move of you to do. When I look at this deck, I'm thinking, ooh, another contender to go for the title here. A lot of strong cards. But again, like I said in, at, at the start of this uh, this little deck tech of your, of your commander deck, you can also be too strong. If you're too strong, everybody's gonna go for you, man. And and, and that's not what you want to have in commander. So, uh, but Rubinia Soul Singer definitely one of the stronger commanders at the table today. Okay, now let's go to the final deck. Let's go to my Falconer deck. And this is the deck that I am bringing to the table today. And um, yeah. 
This deck is built around Sinestian Falconer. Well, actually built around, not really, because Sinestian Falconer is just, um, yeah, uh, it's way too average to really <laughs> build the whole deck around. But I like I like this dude. Let's take a look at what he does. He's um, red and green, three to cast, so five to cast in total, four, four body. So it's, it's a big creature for five. That's already, that's pretty good for me. And then I can tap it to add two extra mana. So it's like a super mana dork. Uh, that is way too expensive. But that means that um, when I can cast it, I will have the next turn, I will have two extra mana, right? So I kind of kept that in the back of my head when I was uh, designing my deck. Uh, I really like the flavor text, by the way, of Snesting Falconer, where he says he has roots in both sorcery and sword play, but he doesn't want to uh, depend too much on the sword play. So he's really a sorcerer. He wants to have a lot of tricks. And I really kept that kind of in my mind when I start brewing this deck. So let's just first look here at the, at the deck picture for a moment. Um, and we can see dice on, uh, on certain cards. Now, what does that mean? As I said in the introduction, we've used a 10 point system. So certain cards are worth points. You can spend no more than 10 points. So what I've done, I've indicated here what cards I've put on, uh, in my deck that are costing me points. So Triskelion is three points. Jam de Tome is three points. IC is two points. Mace is two points. Together is 10 points. That means that, for example, Suchi was one point. I couldn't include Suchi anymore. I couldn't include a Mox anymore because they're also worth points. So you have to kind of make decisions. What cards can you put in your deck? What cards can't you put in your deck? Interestingly enough, a card, for example, like Wheel of Fortune is not worth any points. I think that they did, uh, did this because Wheel of Fortune is just a really fun card to play out. Like everybody gets to draw a new hand. Like who doesn't want to draw new cards? So I think that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, but then again, you know, um, like I said in the introduction, if you check the description, you can find the link to the blog of the Brothers of Fire where they're writing all about this and explaining the whole idea behind their point system. Okay, so let's now get back to the deck. As I said before, in the flavor text of the Falconer, he says, well, I depend more on my sorcery than on my sword play. And I kind of thought of that. So I've uh, tried to make all sorts of little synergies in my deck and I actually made separate pictures so I can show them. Here you see Teutonus' coffin combos in my deck. So Tetravis, Clockwork, Avian, and Triskelion work great with Teutonus' coffin. Teutonus' coffin, artifact for four from the antiquities, three and tap, select a creature, put it in the coffin. Then during your upkeep, you can untap it and when you untap it, a creature goes comes out of the coffin, comes tapped into play. But here's the cool thing. All the triggers go off again. So Tetravus has three counters on it. If it comes out of the coffin, a new three counters are added. So all of a sudden, you have a 7-7 seven, seven flyer. And of course, the same thing goes for Clockwork, Avian, and Triskelion. So that's kind of that synergy. And this is another synergy in my deck. Icy Manipulator and Barrel's Cage. Barrel's Cage sees very little play, probably because of the Icy Manipulator. It's simply the better card, but together they also work quite well. Icy, of course, four to cast, one, and you may tap a land, creature, or artifact. Now, Barrel's Cage also four to cast, but then you have to pay three to use it, and target creature does not untap as normal during its next untap step. The cool thing about Barrel's Cage is you can use it multiple times. So with Icy, I can tap a creature down, and with Barrel's Cage, I can keep it tapped down. That's kind of the combination here. And remember, in my deck, I am expecting to have a lot of mana, a lot of ramp, so I will have the lands to pay to activate Barrel's Cage more than once. Talking about ramp, I'm also playing with Mana Flare, and it's a, it's a really beat up Mana, mana Flare I got from my brother. So Yoop, if you're watching this video, I've included the beautiful Mana Flare in my commander deck and of course i want to combine this with shivan dragon i just want to do old-fashioned like flame throwing fire breathing shivan dragon with that mana flare combination i'm also playing with dragon engine by the way which also goes great with the mana flare and um here is another combination i have in my deck which is which is absolutely ridiculous but still it works a hurricane deals x damage to flying creatures earthquake to ground creatures and I'm playing with Earth says Adventure, which is a card for six to cast. It's a four four, and I can pay zero, um, and then I can choose. I, it gets minus one, minus one until end of turn, and I can give it flying, banding, first strike, trample until end of turn. Now the cool thing is, if I cast my Hurricane, I'm not going to give it flying. If I cast Earthquake, I'm going to give it flying. So that way, my Earth says Adventure always survives. 
It doesn't matter. It always survives. Talking about Earthquake, I also play with Rajan Spirit. Rajan Spirit Earthquake, really nice combination. And I'm um, talking about damage and board sweepers. Look at this Inferno. Inferno, personal favorite of mine. I just think it's a beautiful card. Uh, it's two red, five. It's an instant, so you can cast it whenever you want. And a combination with Jade Statue works really well. I mean, Jade Statue is just great against all like Wrath of God, all sorts of creature sweepers in the format because Jade Statue. It's an artifact, so okay, go ahead, deal damage to every creature. It's an it's a statue. It's nothing. It's a statue, and then of course, when the time is right, it can come to life and it can deal some damage or be a really really solid blocker. Um, a, a couple of other combos to go. There's this uh, tracker two two one uh, green and tea to cast, and for two green and tap, it does an amount of damage equal to its power to target creature, and then that creature does damage back to the tracker. A nice little mini combo is of course with Giant Growth, making it a 5-5 and then um, killing a creature of the opponent like a 4-4 creature. For example, Ramirez Del Pietro, the 4-3 of Frank. Uh, this is a combo I really like. We already saw War Barge in the deck of Frank where he combines it with Merfolk Assassin. I want to combine it with Atok. If you remember the Mana Flare, uh, maybe if I have a Mana Flare on board, I can give all the creatures of, of my opponent's Island Walk then feed the war barge to the Atok, and then all those creatures that have got an island walk by the war barge are actually buried. So this is a way to kill off all the creatures of my opponent. Opponents, I should say, because we're doing multiplayer. So really looking forward to this. And then here is another uh, synergy in my deck. Blood Moon, all non-basic lands are now basic mountains. And then of course I've got Mountain Yeti who has mountain walk, but I also have cave people. And Cave People is a creature where you, that has a pretty cool ability. Two red and one and tap it and target creature gains Mountain Walk. So that's really nice synergy, of course, with the Blood Moon. And then last but not least, um, a classical combination. Combined Nevenerals Disc with Regeneration Creatures and, of course, Rook Egg. I'm going to blow up the board. My Living Wall lives. My Clay Statue lives. My Rook Egg dies, but I'm getting a 4-4 Flyer in return. So it's all bonus for me from there so this is kind of like the synergies of my deck like i i, I had the time to uh, to think about this and show this to you um maybe i've missed a couple of synergies i just think um the deck in general it's quite strong there are some really mean cards in here like i'm playing um with a tsunami and um also with the red card i forgot the name right now but it destroys all the planes so it's in, in here as well um, I'm playing with Dwarven Catapult, so and there's there, there are also a lot of strong creatures. I think I I think this deck can do something. It's not super strong. It doesn't have a strong commander, but I think overall the average level of the cards is quite high. There's a lot of destruction in here, so I can bounce back when I'm when I'm behind. I've got some bigger creatures uh, to to uh, to deal some havoc with. So yeah, only two colors making it reliable. I've got some um, some ramp in here. I'm confident. You know what? Let's do it. Let's go to the game. Let the game begin. And uh, I think I'm actually on the play. I think I won the dice roll. And I'm sitting on the right, of course, with the Timmy playmat. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see if we can follow everything. Starting here with the basic mountain. You can see the uh, life totals on the mobile phones there. And you can also see the four commanders in the middle of the table. And now let's see, turn is now over to Frank with his pirate deck. Really nice altered basic island. And it looks like we're all discussing it before moving along. This this could be, this could take a long time here, this commander game. There we see a bayou on the side of Cusper and passing turn here. Gideon starting with a tropical island and a Lanawar Elves. Pretty good start for Gideon here. So he's got his ramp engine going and I'm starting, uh, well actually not starting second turn here, just playing a Mishra's Factory passing turn. And there's also an Alter Tropical Island here on the side of Frank and he's playing um, the Living Dead. Oh, it's actually an underground sea of course, not a tropical island, it's an underground sea and he's using a black to cast the uh, Walking Dead. It's now a zombie, 1-1 one, one zombie, and you can regenerate it for one black. So it's a pretty solid blocker as well. So the first creatures are slowly coming onto the board. We see a Wailuli Wolf here on the side from uh, from Cusper and just a pass here. And remember, Gidon don't have three mana if you can play a land, if you can find one. 
Yes, he can. And what is he going to play here for three? Going to use all his lands. No, just two of them. And playing a Felwer Stone. Even more ramping here. And I'm going to cast something. Ah, oh, it's an Untamed Wilds. I think that's a pretty good good card, actually. I was surprised that not other people were playing with Untamed Wilds that were adding green to their list. Because it's just a great mana fix for passing turn here. And <laughs> look at me shuffling. Anyway, it's... Uh, Frank Stern here playing an island. Tapping down two islands here. Playing a Dundon. The 4-1 creature from Arabian Nights that can only attack if the opponent has an island. And we see Hideon seems to be the only other player who's playing blue. But we do know that Frank has phantasmal, a Phantasmal Terrain in his deck. And there is a creature here. It's a Royal Assassin from Frank. Wow, that's going to have a board impact. I'm actually, I mean, playing Royal Assassin now, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to take care of that. And let's see. There is a Control Magic from Gideon, probably on the Royal Assassin. You're taking over that Royal. Wow, wow, wow. But it's just a one toughness creature, so it should be doable to kill it. And also, like a royal kind of asks for politics. Here's a barrel's cage, the artifact from the dark. So for three, I can keep a creature tapped. So yeah, I'm pointing out to the royal assassin. Potentially, if he uses his royal, I can then keep it tapped with my barrel's cage. It will cost me three mana though. And I've passed the turn out to Frank. Frank's actually attacking me here. So I'm going to 29, assuming that Gideon will not kill it as long as Frank isn't choosing Gideon as a target to attack here. There's a Badlands from Gusper. And just passing turn here. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Gideon seems to be a little bit in the tank here, thinking, what am I going to do? And it is difficult. I mean, the board state is, is is not that complex yet, but Gideon is kind of has the upper hand at the moment, which can be difficult. He's got five mana and he hasn't played a land drop yet. So does he have a land? Maybe that's the first question. I guess not, or he would have done it. There's a Sage of Latinam here. So that will maybe allow him to sack the Felwer Stone for a card next turn after he taps it for mana if he wants to do, to do that because he's already light on lands of course and i'm tapping four. Oh, look at that even more control from my side now i've got the icy manipulator barrels cage going which is quite nice and uh let's see what rank is going to do here tapping five Casting a pirate ship, so nice, so nice. I really like this deck of Frank here. And that pirate ship is actually quite dangerous because it can blow away a lot of creatures on the table. Of course, while Lodi Wolf can pump itself, but pirate ship can kill two of the three creatures on Hideon's side of the table. And of course, oh, there's a pyrokinesis. And uh, that means Cusper can now divide four damage any way he wants to, he's gonna Killed the Royal Assassin, and um, and he's using the other mana to actually kill the pirate ship. So these pingers are very dangerous here for Cusper apparently. So taking care of two creatures here, and there is a Prodigal Sorcerer, another pinger, a Timmy on the board on the side of Hideon, also playing a Chaos Orb. So he just keeps producing powerful spells here, and he has found the land. It is a strip mine. I'm playing a mountain and am I just passing turn here? No, I'm not. Okay, for a moment there I thought I would just be passing turn. Oh, I'm actually playing my commander, Sinestian Falconer, entering the zone. It is a 4 4, and that means that next turn uh, you can also tap for two mana, so next turn I can use it and potentially if I if I get my land drop, I can have eight mana next turn. Wow. That's a lot. Uh, we'll have to see here how it goes. Frank is looking at his hand. A little bit in the tank here. 
And uh, he's gonna tap three mana here. And ooh, there's a Hummerid spawning bat, the enchantment from Fallen Empires. So you can pay two blue and one to sack a creature and then gain one one camera tokens. Um, and that's dependent on the casting cost of the creature you're sacrificing. For example, if you would sacrifice Dundon, which would be a bad decision, he would get two one one camera tokens because Dundon is too blue to cast. And um, the nice thing of Hummer Spawning Bad is in certain circumstances, if your opponent is going to say, okay, I'm going to, for example, with the Timmy, I'm going to ping your Dundon to death. In response, you can say, I'm going to sack it to the Spawning Bad. The only if here is or but here is that you do need enough mana, of course, to activate the Spawning Bad and it's free to activate. And there we see an Adun Oaken Shield coming on the battlefield on the side of Casper. This is quite interesting. Remember, it's a 1-2 creature, so Kideon cannot ping it to death. And he has a Royal Assassin sitting in his graveyard that he can return next uh, next turn when the Aiden Oaken Shield doesn't have summoning sickness anymore. But of course, the problem still remains that ping around the battlefield for Cusper then. Because if he would play the Royal, it would simply get killed by the Protocol Sorcerer. But let's first see what uh, Kideon is going to do here. Tapping there, he's gonna flip. What is he gonna flip? Oh, he's gonna flip on my IC, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure where that hostility is coming from, Gideon, because I've tapped nothing down on your side, but okay. The nice thing here is that I get to keep my cage. Oh, there's a Howling Mine, so everybody's happy now with Gideon. That's a great way to play Commander. Just, just destroy something and play a Howling Mine. Man, I mean, how can I be upset with somebody playing a Howling Mine? I'm tapping six here. There is a Shivan Dragon. 5-5 five, five Flying Powerhouse. So it looks like I can start dealing some damage next turn. And here you can see that ramp of the Senestian Falconer really helping me here because I couldn't find any more lands, but with the Falconer I still have enough mana to cast my Shivan Dragon. Now the question is, what is Frank going to do? His board is looking um, very mediocre, I wanted to say. But here's a Vesuvan Doubleganger. And he's probably going to copy my Shivan Dragon here. That means there are two Shivans on the board right now. And that is pretty sweet. Maybe he's thinking about copying the Senestian Falconer just because he will get extra mana next turn to cast something, but no, no, no. He's gonna copy the Sheevan Dragon here. Passing turn to Cusper, who's getting back the Royal Assassin. Is he also playing out the Royal Assassin? That is interesting, because it can get killed, right? It can get killed. So isn't this gonna be like an end step kill or maybe they have some politics going on? There is an end step kill. There's the pump by the Walulu Wolf, but then, then then now he can kill it. It doesn't really matter. So I guess kind of a misstep here by by Cusper maybe, or maybe there's some deep, deeper deeper thought behind. It. Oh, a clone hitting the battlefield. Oh man, my Shivan Dragon has so backfired on me. So he's cloning the Vesuvan and then choosing Shivan as a target. So now there are three Shivan Dragons in the game. I'm playing a Dwarven Hold by the way. It's one of those storage lands from um, uh, from uh, from Fallen Empires. And now I'm playing a Clockwork Avian 4-4 Flyer. And uh, the cool thing about the the Dwarven, uh, Dwarven Hold is that it works really well with X spells. So I can just let it get a lot of counters and then at a certain point, just kill somebody with a ridiculous amount of storage counters. Or maybe like wipe the board with Dwarven Catapult or something. Like it's this it's this land that you don't really pay attention to and it starts ticking up and ticking up and ticking up. But okay, I've decided not to attack uh, Gosper by the way. I've just decided I need my, my Shivan on blocking duty right now. Did play another Clockwork Avian. And let's see what Frank is gonna do in his turn, finding another land. Tapping six, casting his Ramirez. His commander as well, 4-3, first striker, finding the board here. And uh, let's see, Cusper here playing a strip mine. Again, getting back the Royal Assassin. He really needs, just needs to get rid of the, uh, of the Timmy. If he can get rid of the Timmy, he's fine. 
And that's also the thing I think think for me, like I can I can decide to um, actually thinking about it now, shouldn't Casper have played the royal and then Gideon would untap his Timmy, try to kill the royal, he could have used his Walulu Wolf. Interesting here, I think Casper should have played maybe the royal in this turn. Oh man, it's very confusing, very confusing. And I think what I wanted to say for me, it doesn't make sense to do anything against the, the Timmy right now because if I kill the Timmy, I'm allowing Casper to uh, to play the Royal. And for me, a Royal is even worse than a Timmy. So just leave the Timmy on the board here. Now let's see what Gideon's gonna do. I mean, he's got two, four, six, seven lands, a lot of lands. Tapping and he's playing a transmute artifact. Yeah, I remember this. Uh, we said that everybody in, in in every deck, if you wanted to, you could make an altar. So if you didn't have the card, you could make an altar. But it had to be like you had to see that you've put some work in the altar. So you couldn't just say uh, with a marker write down transmute artifact. No, you really had to put some time and effort into it. So he made this transmute artifact, and so we were looking at it. And you can see it on the side of Frank. He's made an uh, an underground sea as well. A nice altar. So you're allowed to have two altars in your deck as long as you really like put effort into it. That's our criteria. And look at this, there is uh, a relic barrier. And of course he needs now going for the relic barrier, howling mind combo. That's not cool, Gideon, that's not cool. And it looks like he's gonna attack with the Shivan Dragon. And uh, who is he going to attack? Oh, and actually what's happening now is Casper is using his Wailuli Wolf to uh, give a bonus, I think, to the Shivan of Frank, trying to incentivize him to block the Shivan. So we saw an attack here by Gideon. And there's a Shatter on the Relic Barrier from my side because I want that Howling Mind to keep working. Unfortunately for me, um, you know, it, the, the Relic Barrier is going to work either way because even if I shatter it upon activation... Oh, look at this! He's killing my Clockwork Avian! I want to attack him with the Clockwork Avian. He's, he's playing a Divine Intervention here because I see that opening because the Sheevan is tapped. Wow, so it looks like Gideon is kind of picking a fight here. I've shattered his Relic Barrier, tried to do him some damage with the Avian. He's responding with a divine intervention here, gaining life. And now we're in my second main and I'm playing a Cockatrice, which is a great blocker, by the way. It really helps. Like, people just don't want to attack you when you have a Cockatrice on your side of the table. And um, really interesting, a Tolaria here by Frank, as we're now in Frank's turn again. And I look at the life totals here. Frank's on 25, Cusper and myself are on 29, and Gideon's on 35 here. And I'm curious to see when Gideon's gonna play his Rubinia Soul Singer. I think as soon as he does that, and I think he knows that, as soon as he does that, people will, will start really attacking him and start removing his creature. So maybe it's just a tactic from his side to wait for the perfect moment. Maybe first waiting for a creature to go. And there's the Timmy activation killing the Wailuli Wolf. And I think for Casper, really, this Timmy is just a, a huge pain. And let's see what what is what gonna do here. By the way, I completely missed that. It looks like Frank has played out a ghost ship. You can see it there in the corner of your screen, the 2-4 flyer from the dark. And, oh, this is an interesting, there's a regeneration. Oh, I like this, he's playing Royal Assassin with regeneration in the same turn. And remember, the Timmy was still tapped. So now we have Royal Assessment Assassin on the battlefield with regeneration on it. Oh man, I, can't, I feel like there's a lot happening. And look at that, Gideon's just passing turn here. And I get to draw two cards from the Howling Mine again after taking care of that Relic Barrier. Tapping five here. And what am I doing? Playing a Thicket Basilisk here. 
So it's just, it's just really not a good idea to attack me. That's basically what I'm saying. And the problem here is I want to attack with my Sheevan, but there is that Royal Assassin on the side of Casper. And that is the big problem. So our boards, there are more and more creatures and, and permanents are, are, are getting slammed on the board. But we're in this kind of standstill. Oh, this is so cool. An island fish, Jesconicus. Oh man, you the man, Frank. You the man. This is a 6-8 creature with island home. For people that don't know what that means, it means um, you need to have islands in order for it to survive. And also it can only attack other players that have islands. But uh, really cool to see this creature. And so on flavor when you're building this whole pirate theme deck. It's just this crazy world that, that Frank's deck is living in. There's a mountain by Cusper, it's his turn now. And uh, this game just, just it's it just so stuck. It's so stuck. I think the first thing that needs to happen is we need to get rid of the Royal Assassin for some action here. Royal could help. Getting rid of Royal, I mean. And um, I do see some tap lands on the side of of Cusper, but okay, he's untapping them again. I want to say I'm not sure what they're for. He can use his Oaken Shield, of course, to get his Waluli Wolf back and then cast his Waluli Wolf, but it's a 1-1. One, one. Instead, he plays a Black Knight. I mean, he can also always do that on end step, getting a creature back and passing turn here. Interesting to see. Also to see what Gideon's gonna do. Remember, he just passed the turn last time, did absolutely nothing. So is he going to do something now? I think this, what this, board state asks for is kind of like a board wipe maybe a Nevenerals disc or wrath of god or pyrokinesis that i play with but then again why would i play that because i've got very powerful creatures on the board i don't want to get don't want to lose those creatures tapping four here casting a jade statue so it's just an artifact, but you can pay two and it becomes a 3-6 body. And you can only do that during combat. But it's pretty good. It's pretty good to dodge like pyrokinesis and any any other like mass sorcery speed creature removal spells. So like Wrath of God, for example, it's great against Gideon's Wrath of God. But it doesn't really change anything in the meanwhile my like my dwarven hold is slowly ticking up doing its job and let's see what frank's gonna play oh nabuchanazar and this is oh help me out here it's a legends i can tap it and then i can look into somebody i need to name a card look in somebody's hand if they have the card they have to discard it now, obviously, the first time you use it, you're not really going to know what's in the hand, so you're going to guess, and you probably will guess wrong. But here's the catch. If you then activate it again, you will know the cards in your opponent's hand, and you can start discarding their hand, discarding their, their best threats. But of course, your opponent has a turn to then cast them, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting. It could, it, it could have an effect on the game. It could kind of change the standstill situation. There's a Wailuli Wolf. And there's also a Sorceress Queen here. And I wonder if Gideon's not simply gonna kill the Wailuli Wolf again. Is he going to do that on the end step or has he already taken his turn? That's of course the question here. And there's, there's his Siren Skull. Wait a minute, where did that Siren Skull come from? I think from the side of Frank, he's playing a Siren Skull on Gideon saying, Gideon, you have to attack with everything. Now remember, if he decides, for example, to ping with his Timmy and not attack, his Protocol Sorcerer actually dies. The same thing goes for all his other creatures. So this is basically a board wipe, except for the Chief and Dragon then on the side of Gideon. And he's gonna be completely open. So this is quite an aggressive move here. There is a boomerang. on the Royal Assassin, so that changes something, but 
It means, okay, it means his Shiva will probably survive. And of course, it's not a bad play, this boomerang, because it also takes care of the regeneration. And it means his Shiva survives, but tapping the Timmy now to deal one damage. So he's killed the Dundon on the side of Frank's board. What else is he going to do? He still has to attack with his Sage of Latinam, Sheevan Dragon, so he's gonna sack his Howling Mind for a card. That means his Sage will also die, but he gets a card in return. Losing the Howling Mind, I think that's a good decision because he just drew a card from it and then he has to wait a whole entire turn. Is he gonna tap it this just for a mana? Why not? Why not? It's gonna die anyway. Interesting to see who he's going to attack with the Sheevan. You would expect him to attack Frank here with the Sheevan. On the other hand, Frank can block it with his own Sheevan. Interesting playing a Preacher. And he's attacking Frank here, it seems. And he's going to block the Sheevan with the Pirate Ship. Regenerating the Pirate Ship. And I'm not quite sure what Gideon has done with the Elf. Anyway, they all die except for the Sheevan. And he casts an Azure Drake after that. So he's actually... It's not too bad for, for Gideon. It could have been worse. I mean, he's able to cast two pretty good creatures here. Azure Drake and, of course, the Preacher. Now, Preacher is a creature from the dark. Uh, two white and two, you can tap it. And then you take over a creature that target of target, control, uh, target owner target player I should say uh, sorry but but here's the catch the player that you target can choose oh there's a Nevenerals disc on my side of the table and I still I wonder if this is a good move because I mean I've got pretty good creatures but maybe I'm just fed up and I'm attacking somebody I don't know who I'm attacking actually right now let's see what's what's gonna happen Am I attacking Gusper actually? That doesn't make any sense since, since he has a Sorcerer's Queen. Maybe I was discussing with him not to use his Sorcerer's Queen so I can attack somebody. Am I attacking... It looks like I'm... Am I attacking Frank here? Or am I really attacking Gusper? When I look at the life total, I think... Oh wow, he's chump blocking. And he's also destroying my Nevenerals disc. Ooh, so he's jump blocking. Probably wants to keep his Sorcerer's Queen later for another block, although I'm not sure why. Or maybe he's just forgotten about it. Or did he just cast the Sorcerer's Queen? So many questions. I don't know, it's hard to follow. Anyway, um, he's jump blocked it with his Scrip Sprites. And I think I've passed the turn here and I've lost my Nevenerals disc to that Shatter. And uh, that's kind of okay for me. I don't really mind. It was it was a backup, so... Look at this! There's a huge attack here. Islandfish Jasconicus, Ramirez Del Pietro, and Sheevan Dragon. And Nebuchadnezzar also attacking? Really? No. Not the Knezzar. Also the Knezzar? He's attacking with... I think it's a 2-3 the Knezzar, so he could attack with it. And he, it looks like he's attacking Gideon. So I think Frank and Gideon really have kind of this uh, rumble going on right now. And look at the life total there of Gideon. It's going down. It's going all the way to 20. And there is an enemy dead on the pirate ship. And one of the things that just, just came into my mind, just a thought, one of the things that Frank can do later in the game is sack his island fish Jasconicus. And ooh, interesting. He's gonna change one of my lands to an island actually with that magical hack. And you see that counter on my mountain. That is now an island. And that means that island fish Jasconicus can now also attack me. So that's a pretty cool way from Frank here to turn one of my basic lands into an island. And um, yeah, what I wanted to say is that Frank can actually use his hammered spawning bed and then uh, sack his Islandfish Jasconicus for tons of camera tokens. And you see Cusper there. Oh, there's a Disintegrate <laughs> on the pirate ship. Cusper really doesn't like that pirate ship because he's got so many like smaller creatures on the board. 
And there's a Royal Assassin again. And this is what you have when you're playing against somebody with an Aedun Oaken Shield deck. You keep seeing those strong creatures coming back over and over and over and over and over again. And um, I'm playing with Disintegrate. I'm really looking forward to Disintegrate the, uh, the Oaken Shield. Although then it just gets back to the command zone, right? So I shouldn't do that. Anyway, it looks like um, there's just a GM Day Tome by Gideon and then he's passing turn. And I'm using my Barrel's Cage on the Island Fish Chasconi because since I have an island now, so I'm trying to kind of protect myself. So I'm doing that end step of Gideon. And my, uh, my Dwarven Hold now has five counters on it. I've got quite a lot of land actually. Tapping my island, two forests. And casting Rajan Spirit. So it's a 2-3. I can tap it and then target a creature who loses flying until end of turn. And what a match this is. It is just stuck. Like there's a swing every once in a while, but... And to be honest, I'm confused. I don't really understand why the Island Fish is untapping right now. If I use my Barrel's Cage on it, it shouldn't untap. So maybe there was a miscommunication there. And it looks like Frank is just passing turn, not really doing anything. Passing turn here to Cosper's playing a Pendlehaven, which actually is quite good against all those pingers, although all those pingers are killed already. But it's another way, I guess, to protect his royal assassin. And he also has that white lily wolf. And taking a damage now. And I have to say that Aiden Oakenshield is, is really impressive. Look at this, a ball lightning. And who is he going to attack? I'm afraid it's going to be me, because I attacked him with the Shivan not too long ago. And he's going to attack me, and now I have to decide what I want to do. The problem, of course, is that... Uh, oh, it looks like I'm just going to take the damage here. I want to say the problem is the Sorcerer's Queen. And there you see Gideon drawing a card from his Tome at the end of turn. And here we see a combo, by the way, on the side of Cusper, which is quite nice. It is the Aiden Oakenshield Ball Lightning combo. So you can now use Aiden Oakenshield end of turn on Frank's side, get it back and play it again in his turn. That means more damage for me. So th th this is actually a problem now that I think about it. And there is an Elfish, I think it's an Elfish Hunter on the side of Gideon. It can keep a creature tapped, I believe. And uh, it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like the barrel's cage. It can be handy. But I have a problem here. I need maybe just a big fireball to get rid of a couple of those one ones. Okay, Chaos Orb can work. Chaos Orb can work. But I mean, this is a problem. I really wonder what Cusper's going to do next turn. Is he going to get his ball lightning back again? And, and Oh, this is nice. A soul net here from Frank. That can maybe buff his life total a little. Soul net, an artifact, and every time a creature goes to the graveyard, you can pay one and you can gain a life. So that's that, that can be pretty useful in a game like this. And it looks like Frank's a little bit in the tank here. And you have to imagine, this is a fast-forwarded game as well, so can you imagine how long this took? It was wonderful. I like, I, I, I love these long games, just sitting there, drinking some beer, playing ridiculous cards, I like it. I'm not sure what Frank's gonna, gonna do, if he's gonna do anything, actually. He's looking at his hand again. Is he just gonna pass here? Really, really in the tank. Is he, is he, does he want to... Interestingly enough, the last couple of turns, Gideon and Frank have really been battling it out. And, and, and I think because of a result of that, you could see Kasper also kind of attacking me. And I'm, and I'm, I'm attacking Kasper as well with the Sheevan, so... 
but it looks like we're kind of back in this kind of standstill phase here. Frank just passing the turn. And now Cusper, it's, it's, his, it's his turn to kind of think and see like, what do we want to do here? And the first thing he does is he turns on the light. And that's not ideal for my camera, by the way. It's kind of annoying here, so apologies for that. But let's uh, concentrate on the magic. Let's see what happens here. Aiden Oakenshield activation. Couldn't quite see what he's getting back though. Probably the script sprites that he lost earlier in the game. And let's see, is he playing anything out here? We just see the tap mana for that Aiden Oakenshield activation. And that seems to be it at the moment. Tapping more land here, taking another damage here. And there is the ball lightning again. Of course he's getting the ball lightning back and not the script sprites. <laughs> I could have been so stupid. Anyway, look at this. I'm activating my Jade statue to block, but look what he's doing. Of course, he's activating his Sorcerer's Queen. That means I now take four damage and I lose my Jade statue. <sighs> that was a bad play on, the, on my part. And again, I'm taking damage, going down to 19 here. Let's see what uh, Hyeon can do. Things are not looking good at the moment for me. I need to find a way to to get rid of that Aiden Oaken Shield or to remove the Bow Lightning. And look at that, I'm using my Barrel's Cage to keep the Aiden Oaken Shield tapped so that he cannot use it next turn. So at least that's something. What else can I do here? Counting my lands. Untapping my Dwarven Hold. This could be a big move here on my part. You know when your opponent is doing this, doing the calculating, something's gonna happen and I have something planned here. After taking all that damage from the Bull Lightnings, I, I feel like I have to do something here. First taking a zip of my beer, weighing my options, counting again. The problem usually with these multiplayer games is that you have enough power to maybe kill kill one if you're lucky two opponents, but in this case there's still everybody's still in the game. I'm on 19. If I go all out killing one opponent, it will probably mean the death of, uh, of myself next turn. There's a dwarven catapult! Huge dwarven catapult! And this is of course why I'm playing with these storage lands, why I'm playing with dwarven hold. I think this is very flavorful, by the way. Dwarven Catapult into... A Dwarven Hold into Dwarven Catapult, I mean. And uh, I'm trying to kill all the creatures here of Cusper. And the way Dwarven Catapult works is it's red and X to cast. And then there's X damage divided equally to all the creatures of the opponent. And look at that. The only creature that's surviving here is the Royal Assassin. Edun Oakenshield going back to the command zone. And I kind of, I remember saying to Cusper, I, I kind of feel forced to do this. It's all part of the game, of course, but you know, you've attacked me so often with the bull lightning. <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's crazy. But now next turn, of course, actually in, on the end step of Frank, Cusper can use his Royal, I guess, to kill my commander here. Don't really mind that much, but he can do it, have some revenge. And uh, let's look, is Frank actually gonna do something? It is Frank's turn, it seems. Tapping four here. Playing Steel Artifact on the GM Day Tome. And in response, Hideon's gonna activate it. And Frank is going to get the Tome here for himself. Of course, it is tapped. That is a pretty good target, I have to say. Probably the best target on the board. I mean, if you take the Chaos Orb, you're kind of forcing your opponent to use it, but why, why would Frank do that right now? Because there's still a pretty big chance that I will use that Chaos Orb against somebody else. And there exactly, we see that Royal Assassin activation on my Senestian Falconer, which is right now behind my beer, by the way, but it is there, so it's going back to the command zone. And then, oh, interesting. So now we see what happens. Gion, in response, is using his Preacher to steal the Royal Assassin. So actually, this is all working in the advantage of Gideon here. And look at the board state. 
of Cusper. He has nothing left after that Dwarven Catapult. And I remember feeling kind of guilty. There is nothing. On the other hand, he can simply replay, recast his Aedun Oaken Shield and start taking back those creatures from his graveyard. And I really wish I would have put a Torment's Crypt in my deck, seeing this Aedun Oaken Shield in action here. And Gideon's going to untap with this Preacher, of course, remaining tap, but having that Royal Assassin on the board. There we see an Ashes to Ashes taking care of the GM Day Tome and the Soul Net of Frank here. And wow, that's a pretty, pretty good answer here from Gideon. So Frank was able to use the Janum Tome zero times, ladies and gentlemen. What a brutal play here by Gideon, and he's tapping even more. There's a Mahamoti Jin 5 6 Fire Powerhouse. But there is a counter spell from Frank. It was hard to see, but that was a counter spell. And oh man, I think the war is fully on here. Man, man, man. And of course, I'm happy to see that. And. Um, it looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here, thinking what to do. And I'm playing a Tsunami. Oh, this is brutal. This is brutal, especially for Gideon. Of course, for Gideon, also for Frank here, losing all those lands. Ay, ay, ay. That also means that Islandfish Jeskonicus will die because he no longer has islands. This is extremely brutal, but also for Gideon here. And uh, look at that, there's that Halmerid spawning bat activation by Frank in response. He had enough mana, so he's gonna sack his island fish to the Halmerid spawning bat. That means he gets 1-1 one, one Comrade tokens equal to the casting cost of the island fish Jeskonicus. And we can see he's got now 7-1-1 one, one creatures. So at least he was able to get something out of the deal. And now, uh, wow, wow, I still have my Chaos Orb to use. The problem, of course, is if I use my Chaos Orb, for example, on the Royal Assassin, it simply goes to the Graveyard of Cusper, and Cusper can get it back with his Aiden Oaken Shield. That's the problem. If I kill Cusper, he's gonna lose, Gideon's gonna lose the Royal Assassin anyway. Look at this, Sword of the Ages coming into play tap. This is really cool. Sword of the Ages, an artifact from Legends, 60 cast, and um, you can tap it and you can sacrifice X amount of creatures and deal X amount of damage to a creature or a player based on the power of all the creatures combined. So for example, if you would sacrifice uh, all his comrade tokens here, he's got seven one one comrade tokens, they would be removed from the game. They would be in exile. The sword would be as well, by the way, and he could deal seven damage to a target. So the sword is a great way to kind of finish a player off, even if they're on a higher life total. But at this point, I don't think it will do that much. But it is, it is a dangerous artifact to have in the game. And there's some more tapping here happening. A bottle of Suleiman. <laughs> Pretty cool. He's got to flip a coin. Why not? Beautiful coin. And he's going for the flip. And it looks like he's going to take damage here. He is taking five damage, going down to 21. So unfortunately, the flip didn't turn out in his favor. The way bottle of Suleiman works, you got to flip a coin. The opponent can say heads or tails. If the opponent is right, you're going to get five damage. If the opponent is wrong, you're going to get a five five flyer. flyer. And here we see a crumble on the icy manipulator. That means four more life here for Gideon. And there is a chaos or flip on the sword of the ages here. Interesting. Sword of the ages is gone. Apparently, I'm afraid of the Sword of the Ages. Not quite sure why. But it is, of course, a dangerous artifact. And it's a lot of power. And I'm on, on the lowest life total, I guess. And we see a tapped Royal Assassin. That's quite interesting. Not, not really sure how that happened, by the way. 
there's a lot happening at the moment. And tapping my... Ooh, look at that! Tapping my Dwarven Hold also. And this is a rocket launcher from the Antiquities, four to cast, and you can pay two and you can deal one damage to any target and you can do it as often as you want, but at the end of the turn, when you've activated it, it is destroyed. So you can use it for one full turn. But at the moment, I don't have I don't have a lot of mana, although there are a lot of annoying one ones. I can kill the preacher, I can kill the royal, I can kill the oaken shield. That would take eight mana in total. That is definitely doable. And uh, it looks like Frank is going to use his uh, Abu Nasar to look at the hand of Gideon. So you can see the two cards we saw, a Psyblast and a Simbad. It's actually only, only for Frank to see, but we all got to see it. Why not? And... Um, yeah, that's some information. I think Psyblast is a good card, but just, you know, in multiplayer, it's not as strong since you just have so many targets. And let's see, it looks like it's Gusper's turn and in end step, he wants to activate his Aiden Oaken Shield. Or maybe it's already his turn because I think he cast his Aiden Oaken Shield last turn, so it still has summoning sickness. But he's looking in his graveyard nonetheless, trying to find a good card to get back with the Oaken Shield. And maybe, maybe it would just be good to keep killing the Oaken Shield, making it so expensive for him to cast. Look at that. Getting back the, um, the Bull Lightning again. And I do feel this is not possible because it just had summoning sickness, but maybe I'm wrong. So then he would have paid. I mean, he could have done it, doesn't matter. Is he gonna attack me again? No, this time he's gonna attack Gideon. I kind of feel lucky here, but he doesn't have, of course he doesn't have his, um, his, uh, his queen anymore. That's what I was looking for to make it 0-2, but still he could have attacked me. He's not doing it, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Instead attacking Gideon. Gideon dropping to 18, playing a Witch Hunter here. Remember, Witch Hunter is pretty annoying because it can bounce creatures, so it's actually pretty good defense against uh, against the Bull Lightning, because you can simply bounce it back to hand. It does cost two white and two, though, for that effect. So it's pretty taxing, and of course the... Hunter still has summoning sickness right now. It's it's my turn, by the way. Looks like I'm gonna cast something. Ooh, interesting here. A Tonus's coffin. That is three to activate. And it looks like I don't have enough mana to use the coffin as well. I'm also playing uh, a tap land from uh, from Fallen Empires there. Passing turn here to Frank. Is he going to do something on his end step? It looks like he is going to sacrifice his Ramirez del Pietro at the end of his turn. That is a pretty cool move. That means he gets five more camera tokens. Look at the amount of camera tokens over there. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen camera tokens. I guess Ramirez is six to cast then. A lot of camera tokens, it seems, on the side of Frank. And what does he want to do with this? Oh, Sunken City! Sunk what? What? He's attacking Gideon with all his camera tokens. They've now turned into 2-2s two because of the Sunken City. They're blue 1-1 one -one creatures, but they're now 2-2s. Two and Gideon is on 18, doesn't have that much life. Let's count the amount of camera tokens here one more time. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 tutus coming into the direction of Gideon. And this is difficult. He can kill one with his royal, so that's gone. And he can pump the factory and kill one. And he just has to take the damage. He's on two life. <laughs> but he's not dead yet. 
As long as he's still alive. He's on two. Oh, man. But also for Frank, I mean, he's completely... Well, he's not completely tapped out. He's not tapped out, actually. And he's still got a ghost ship to block. And he's got his Walking Dead and his Nebuchadnezzar, so it's not too bad. He can actually use his Nebuchadnezzar again on the hand of Gideon to get rid of that Psy Blast. Although that Psy Blast is now... It, it, I mean, Gideon can't use it anymore because he's on two, So, but he could use it to get rid of the Simbad in hand of Gideon. But then again, he would lose the Nebuchadnezzar next turn to the Royals, so it's probably not going to do that. And here, again, we see an end step activation of Kasper with his Adun Oakenshield. That Adun Oakenshield is doing so much work and again he's getting back his ball lightning i wonder what he's gonna do i mean if he's gonna attack me i can still use i can use my rocket launcher once but then i am going to i will lose my rocket launcher let's first see who he's gonna attack here with this ball lightning And this is going to be very interesting. He can attack Gideon here for six, kill Gideon. Although, no, he cannot kill him because he's got two flyers. The clone is a Sheevan Dragon and he's got the Azure Drake. So that's not going to happen here. But he can make it difficult for Gideon. He can also choose to attack Frank. And of course, he can choose to attack me. Basically, he can just attack for free. Well, I mean, it's going to cost him mana, but he can just get the Bull Lightning back again and again and again. And I think I'm going to use my Tonus's coffin to uh, to take the Adun Oaken Shield here. Because this is just getting tiring and tiring. And maybe Cusper knows this as well. Maybe Cusper knows if I attack if I attack Timmy here, he is he is most likely to uh, put my Adun Oaken Shield in a box and do I really want to do that? Interesting situation here, and Kasper still thinking, looking at his hand, what to do. He's on 21, Gideon's on 2, I'm on 19, and uh, Frank's actually on 29 still. And it looks like he's attacking Frank here, Frank taking 5, probably because he's on the highest life total. And there is a Killer Bees. And I think this is a pretty political decision from Kasper, I think it's a pretty good decision. And let's see what Gideon's going to do. He's just going to untap past turn here. Interesting. Having that Royal Assassin untapped, having enough mana for the Witch Hunter. And Gideon is the only player that hasn't played his commander the entire game. Crazy and such a strong commander. <laughs> Dragon Engine on my side. I think, I think it would have been better to just keep mana untapped for my Rocket Launcher and my... Uh, Thomas is coughing, to be honest, but okay. Deciding not to. Deciding not to. Passing turn here to Frank. And uh, yeah, this is this is going to be interesting. So Frank is going to pay two blue for the Sunken City. And, uh, and yeah, what's going to happen here? He's got an army of comrades. Is he going to attack with them again? Maybe attack Kasper for that Bull Lightning attack. Although it's probably best to just keep it untapped for now. I mean, we're all still in this. But that two life of Gideon, and of course he's playing against two players that also have red, that have red in their decks. Kasper with red, and of course myself with red. And I haven't played, well, I've played Dwarven Catapult, but I haven't played Fireballs, Disintegrate, Lightning Bolt, Chain Lightnings, whatever. I haven't done all that. So Gideon probably knows that that's all still in the deck somewhere. And it looks like Frank is attacking you with the camera tokens, dealing a lot of damage here to uh, to Cusper. Look at that. Cusper's on nine all of a sudden after that camera attack. That is pretty brutal, and Frank is really, uh, really attacking a lot in this game. Deciding, you know what, I've got the Camerids, I might as well attack with it, that's what they're there for. And uh, that means that Cusper is only also in single digit numbers. 
And there we see an air elemental and a Simbat. Interesting enough is Frank here already knew about the Simbat. He could have said Simbat when he activated his Nebuchadnezzar. Ah oh well. And now Cusper's untapping here, playing a forest, which is which is good for his killer beast. That killer beast is pretty huge actually. He has a maze of if as well to protect himself. Interesting here, by the way, is I was talking about, you know, direct damage this and direct damage that, but of course I've got that rocket launcher. I can actually kill Gideon if I want to, but why would I right now? Because if I kill him, I'm just going to give a Royal Assassin back to Cusper here. I don't want to do that. And tapping three. Playing a Mana Flare. <gasps> oh! oh, wow. I think, I think Cusper's like, you know what? I'm just going to do something. And I think he's attacking with the Killer Bees. Is he attacking me with the Killer Bees here? He can, he can pump it up. He's got a lot of green mana. And uh, let's see what he's going to do. Or he's going to turn it into... He's going to tap three green, and with the Mana Flare, that means double mana, or let's have a look, let's read Mana Flare here. Let's see how it works again. How does Mana Flare work? So this Mana Flare will have a huge impact on the board, since uh, every time you tap a land for mana, it will produce an extra uh, one additional mana of the same type. So everything is basically double now, and let's take a look here. Gideon doing a lot of stuff here on end step creating uh, a wasp token and taking his turn here. But that means that my rocket launcher is now really, really put online here because of the mana flare. And it's going to be interesting. What will Gideon do here with this turn? He needs his mana, I guess, to keep his witch hunter open. He wants to keep his royal open. So it looks like he's just passing turn here, passing the turn on to me. And I start counting my lands here because my lands are double now because of the mana flare. That means that one land equals one damage with that rocket launcher. And maybe, just maybe, I can uh, take down two birds with one stone because I'm going to try to kill um, Gusper here and the player on my right side as well, Gideon. And of course, Gideon is on two, so that's easier to do with the rocket launcher that will only take me two lands to kill him but of course I will be giving that royal back and that royal is also a potential blocker and it's going to be much more tricky uh, trickier to kill actually um, Gusper here so let's see so I'm tapping some lands here looks like I'm first going to take out the royal assassin and I have two more damage here okay I'm just first tapping a mountain here taking out the royal assassin tapping two more here to kill the hypnotic specter and actually, it looks like I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm deciding to kill Gideon here. And in response, Gideon is going to use his Witch Hunter to shoot back my um, my Shivan Dragon to my hand. And I'm using Rajan Spirit here on the Hypnotic Spectre to make loose flying, it seems. Or not. No, I'm not doing that. Probably going to use it to attack. Remember, Rajan Spirit is actually a 3-2. And I'm looking at his land again. Of course, he still has that maze of if. I've got a dragon engine, a thicket basilisk, a cockatrice, and a rajan spirit to attack with. And of course, I can animate my Mishra's factory, but maybe it's better to use it for land with my rocket launcher. So am I, will I be able to kill him here? That is the big question. He is still on 9 life, it's quite a chunk. I can also choose to maybe use Barrel's Cage to keep the Killer Beast tapped. It looks like I'm going for it though, so I'm activating my Taunus' Coffin here and I'm trying to take the Adun Oaken Shield, trying to put it into the Coffin. In response, he's probably gonna use it to get something back, although, I mean, he has to survive, right? He has to see the writing on the wall as well that I'm trying to kill him here. I'm not sure if this is the best move on my side. Then again, I mean, I'm taking care of a blocker. That's at least something. And now I've got four creatures to attack, possibly five. 
looks like counting my lands or my creatures here I still have some lands left to deal some damage I could take care of the hypnotic specter for example or just deal direct damage to Cosper. So Rajan Spirit is three, and I can deal the Thicken and a Cockatrice is four, is seven, I can attack with the Dragon Engine is eight. That means he would go on one, but he still has his Maze of If. It looks like I'm also going to deal direct damage now with the Rocket Launcher. This would be two damage here to the Hypnotic Spectre. Taking out the Hypnotic Spectre, attacking with everything, he's Sending back my Dragon Engine, that means I'm going to deal 7 damage. And that means he's on 2, and I think if I sack my land here and I tap, I have exactly 4 mana, and I can actually kill Cusper here. Oh, this is a big turn. This is a big turn. Actually, do I have mana left? I'm not really following what I'm doing here, but it looks like it's a huge turn for me. After taking out Gideon out of the game, I'm also taking Cusper out of the game and I'm playing a red elemental blast on Frank here wow this is huge and let's see what Frank can do he is looking at his hand now he only oh, he only has how many camera tokens are at his side of the board five one one camera tokens and the walking dead a one one regeneration um, zombie and of course next turn I will un untap and I still have that Sheevan dragon in hand so Frank really needs to do something big here to get back into this game. And oh, look at this! He's playing that um, Venerian Gold, and the way this works is an enchant creature, uh, two blue and X, and his X in this case is five. And that means that during the upkeep, I can take one gold counter off, or gold dust counter, I'm not sure what it's called. And when all the counters are gone, I can finally untap my Cockatrice. So it looks like he's doing it for four though. So that means that the upcoming four turns, I won't be able to untap my Cockatrice. And he's also attacking with his Camarade. So I'm dropping to 15 here. And Frank is still on 24. So he's, he's got some life to play with. And I don't have any flyers anymore that I can use to attack at the moment, but I'll probably cast my Sheevan Dragon now. And that will give me a 5-5 five, five flyer that I can pump with red mana. And there we see the Sheevan Dragon back on the board. And it's probably better now just to keep my creatures uh, on blocking duty. And that's exactly what I do. Passing turn here. And I wonder what Frank can do here. He needs to find a solution for the Sheevan Dragon. If he can, that means at least 8 damage next turn. Because I've got three mountains, and of course I could also use the Dwarven Hold, but probably going to keep it tapped. That means that Frank is now on a three-turn clock, but maybe, I mean, he's got a lot of cards in hand. Maybe he has a solution. He is playing with blue, I mean, perhaps some kind of cloning thing. A control Magic would be quite good here. But Black, of course, maybe he just has a Terror and he can just take care of the Sheevan. So we'll just have to see what he can do here. Tapping four. Oh, playing a clone! Clo oh, look at this water turn slamming Oubliette on the table here, taking my Sheevan Dragon and, of course, first cloning it. Now that means that Frank has a Sheevan and I have nothing, absolutely nothing. I need to get rid of the Oubliette here using Thomas's coffin to put the cloned Sheevan in the box here. At least protecting me from it. Oh, and there's Tranquility. This is exactly what the Doctor ordered. And uh, that means that the Sheevan Dragon comes back into play. I do believe it has Summoning Sickness again. So that means I'll probably be passing turn here. I am attacking. Look at that. Attacking with a Thicket. And uh, Frank blocking here on one of his Camera Tokens. Wow, 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 wow. What a turn by Frank and what a turn by me as well. Having that Tranquility as an answer. But that was quite a brilliant move by Frank, and he almost got back into the game here. Let's see, he's going to cast something else for four. What could it be? And okay, <laughs> this is a Rod of Ruin. Usually a Rod of Ruin is very good uh, in a commander game, because there's always something to ping. But in this case, it's not going to help him much. I'm attacking him for seven, pumping it up, dealing 11 damage here. That means that he's going to drop to 13, playing a Felwer Stone. 
And of course, I, I actually should have played that Felwer Stone before, because of that City of Brass on the side of Frank, it would have meant another pump for my Sheev and Dragon. But Frank needs to find a solution now. He has to take care of this Sheevan Dragon. He has to take care of this Sheevan. Let's see what he can do. If he can't, he is dead next turn. He has to do something. Tapping and oh, look at that. Bringing back Ramirez the Pietro. And uh, that means he's bringing the captain on the ship to sink with it. And uh, I think that's very noble of you, Frank. And uh, you you have a great deck. You have a great deck. And you had a great comeback. But um, I was just in luck. And it looks like I am killing him here. Even having a chain lightning to kill him even more. And uh, that means this is the game of Commander. And that is the game. Crazy. Crazy, crazy game. Oh, I'm sorry for uh, for the camera quality once again. It's something to to uh, to keep in the back of my head when I'm recording this. Uh, but wow, man, this was a really cool game of Commander. And um, actually, after this game, we decided to play some more Commander games. Uh, let me know what you think of this. Do you like old school Commander? What do you think? What do you play it yourself? If so, what kind of point system do you use? if you use any um yeah let, let me know let me know what you think of these type of, of videos here on the channel i just want to thank you for for watching and i'm sure there are there are, you know we've made a lot of playing mistakes it's uh, it was hard to keep up with everything as well for me also commentating this match for you uh thank you for watching another episode of timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic if you want to support the channel, you can do that by watching the video. You've done it already. Thank you very much. Not using an ad blocker is also very much appreciated. Um, of course, leaving a like, leaving a comment and becoming a subscriber if you're not subbed yet. All that really helps because then you show to YouTube that you enjoy my content, that you enjoy Timmy Talks and then you help the show grow. Talking about that, you can also support us on Patreon. You can become a member of Patreon and actually join into a lot of events where we're organizing tournaments. We've got a Discord. Um, I've got I've got like silly giveaways and stuff. Anyway, um, if you want to check out the Patreon page of Timmy Talks, I would really appreciate it if you could join and become a patron of Timmy Talks. Talking about the patrons, let's go to the end scroll and let's look at the fantastic, amazing, super patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te somber kan zien.